Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I uh, really appreciate the uh, invitation to come and talk to you here and, and get to meet um, uh, a lot of people and, and, and talk about a lot of things. And I uh, appreciate that the hospitality and all the arrangements that have made, been made for me to be able to uh, be here. Uh, it, the talk that I'm going to give really represents the work of a lot of other people. Um, people at NASA centers, some people in academia, um, some inputs from other uh, government agencies. So I, they, they, they really prepared all the, um, uh, the, did all the science and really prepared their presentations and the visualizations. And I get to have the, 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 the privilege and the fun of, um, uh, of uh, uh, talking about their work. Um, and. Uh, so that, that's what I will do. Uh, I'd like to start out by uh, looking, at the, looking at the Earth from space. Um, uh, looking at the Earth from space. And what, what this does is it shows the, um, the, the Earth uh, in daytime using a, um, uh, the uh, instrument VIRS that flies aboard the uh, National um, uh, Polar Orbiting Partnership satellite, uh, or the SUMI, National Polar Orbiting Partnership, named for Van SUMI, the father of satellite meteorology. I was launched in 2011. Um, and that gives you sort of the visible Earth. And when you think about the Earth as a natural system, you can see the things that we're used to seeing in the Earth. You see forests, you see oceans, you see clouds, you see deserts. Um, all the things that we come to think about sort of the, the natural Earth. Um, but if you use the same uh, satellite instrument to look at the Earth at night, you get a very different picture. Um, because where you have lights on at night, that's where you have either well, really both large concentrations of people or large amounts of in industrial activity and the infrastructure that, um, uh, th th that will support uh, l large uh, uh, groups of humans engaged in industrial activity. So that's where we are typically will be perturbing the Earth system by putting trace gases into the atmosphere, putting particulates into the atmosphere, and changing the surface of the Earth through things like urbanization and deforestation. And you only, uh, there's lots of places in the world that you can look at uh, deforestation, and this represents a uh, Landsat imagery over a period of years where one can see um, deforestation in and around an area that, that was turned into a national park in, um, in Indonesia. But the, the point is, as I expect, I really don't need to tell you that, that we are changing the face of the earth in a, way, in a way that matters for the planet, and changes involving uh, forests are a big part of the changes that are taking place. So. What I'm going to do in the talk is say a little bit about how we study the Earth at NASA with remote sensing, show you some things that we're seeing and what we're learning, um, tell you what we're going to be doing in the future. Um, but as much as, say, as a space agency, we would like to be able to say that we can do everything that we need to do with satellites, we can't. Um, so I'd like to say a little bit about some of the things that we're doing, um, especially with aircraft. And by the time we get to conclusions, I'll have run out of time, so I probably won't get to them. Um, but there's some neat imagery at the end that I want to remember the show. So um, for a lot of you here, I probably don't need to uh, uh, talk about the electromagnetic spectrum, but I like to introduce talks like this by re reminding ourselves that uh, that the electromagnetic spectrum provides the tools that we have uh, for remote sensing, but the challenge is to turn photon cancer detectors into physical and biological information about the Earth. So what, what the um, scientists and engineers have done over the years have gotten very creative about how to take advantage of the spectrum, you know, choosing the wavelength, choosing the viewing geometry, matching it up to the orbit of the satellite, um, really using an the measurement approach. And in some cases, if nature doesn't give us enough of our sig a signal, bring our own source. You bring a laser on the satellite, you do LIDAR. Bring a microwave transmitter on the satellite, you do radar. So we're not necessarily stuck with the limitations that nature provides for us. Um, so, you know, it, it, 
you, you, you try to pick the exact approach to go with the problem that you're that you're looking to solve, and what the, there's no as we say one size fits all kind of thing. So we through judicious choices of all of the parameters that one has to pick from, you um, can study a variety of different things. Relative to forests, there's a whole whole bunch of things, and I'm going to give some examples of them, but not just focusing on the forests themselves, but trying to say something about the, the impacts of forests and their change on the Earth system. Um, if we show um, the satellites that we have operating to study the Earth, this is sort of a sort of attractive diagram that shows lots of satellites, lots of abbreviations, lots of acronyms, um, maybe not in the most helpful way. Um, a couple of points to make is that, that one is that um, there's a lot, depending on how one counts, there's about 20 missions that we have um, uh, looking down at, at, at the Earth, studying the Earth, or studying those parts of the sun that are directly uh, influencing um, the Earth. Um, about half of them represent international partnerships uh, where there's some kind of sharing that goes on with uh, uh, partner nations or um, where they may provide an in, uh, instrument or they've provided a launch. So there's a, a lot with the traditional partners that um, you would think of with uh, coming from the Western Europe, from Japan, from Canada. Uh, there's some that we had one with Brazil. Uh, we had one with Argentina, although that satellite failed. Um, Finland is represented um, through the Aura satellite. There's a, a ozone monitoring instrument um, called ozone monitoring instrument contributed from the uh, Netherlands with, um, uh, uh, but the contributions from Finland, especially in Italian with the Finnish Meteorological Institute. Um, and uh, one could point out this uh, SUMI NPP and say, well, it's got SUMI in the name, so there's a Finnish connection. Um, one time I was giving a talk like this to somebody um, working out of the executive office of the president, and she stopped me right there and said, my family's from Finland, tell me about the SUMI NPP. Um, as I said, Vera Nasumi was the father of satellite meteorology. Um, uh, the, the, it, this is a mix of small satellites with one instrument, big satellites with about five instruments, old satellites, I think the oldest ones here launched in 1999, new satellites, the newest one here launched in 2015. There's instruments aboard the International Space Station, and one of them, GRACE, is actually two of them. It's two satellites that fly um, in close proximity. And uh, what that matter, what that gives us, uh, and this shows our NASA Earth Science Research satellites, so there's a lot, but this doesn't include the satellites from our um, operational partners in the U.S. It doesn't include the satellites from uh, research or operational partners from outside the, outside the U.S. Uh, so this is just what we at NASA are doing. But what you can see, a um, couple of things I like to point out. One is there's a lot, and especially since most of the satellites are in polar or orbits, that means that we're getting good coverage. There's really no part of the Earth that we can't see with the satellites that are looking down. Um, we're over each pole 14 to 16 times a day with most of the satellites. Where a typical orbit is about 90 to 100 minutes, so 14 to 16 orbits a day, moving seven kilometers a second, uh, half the orbit in day, half the orbit in night. Um, we uh, tend to take it for granted for a while, um, after a while, but it's a marvelous engineering achievement just keeping these satellites going is a significant thing. Uh, you'll see some of them, it looks like they're really chasing after each other, flying in close formation. So we call that the um, A-train, um, because some of the satellites are aqua or um, orbiting carbon observatory, clouds are Calypso, and there's actually a Japanese satellite that's in the constellation as well. Um, you get the benefits of near simultaneity, um, but you can never get all that instrument, all those instruments up at the same time on the same spacecraft. So we can build up a way of looking at the uh, uh, the Earth. But the, so the, the real point of this, I think, just besides the the sheer wonder and joy of it. Um, is that what this means is really for the first time in human history, we have more or less equivalent quality environmental information anywhere on the planet, uh, which for most of human history, we only knew about where we were. Um, but now we get the information about the whole planet. It's just about as good. You have to be careful in very different regimes to know that your algorithms work quite well. Um, but especially some of the, the hardest areas to observe tend to be the most vulnerable ones or ones that are most subject to change and, and are frequently really in areas where either hard to work in, not safe to work in, or the infrastructure is lacking. So that's things like ice sheets, um, uh, sea ice, open oceans, um, 
uh, uh, boreal forests, tropical forests, mountainous regions. Um, with the satellites that we have, um, we, we can get good data. Um, and I'll say a little bit about that. Launches are important. Ten, and um, nine, this shows eight, uh, one of the last seven, big launches that we had. Six, you get a little bit of a countdown, too. Five, this is the soil moisture four, active passive three, satellite that two, <coughs> was launched one, from the West Coast to the U.S. a little over um, off, about a year and a half ago. Um, and uh, is, uh, I think it all starts with the launch, but it really starts long before the launch. Um, something else I'd like to emphasize is that um, Getting data out there and making data available is a huge part of what we do. Uh, we make our data publicly available. Um, we try to encourage others to do the same and lead by example. So we have data centers out around the U.S. where, you know, you can download the data. Um, and uh, some of it's really big, uh, so you got to have bandwidth. Um, uh, but the, the the point is that uh, if what we get you can have, so like say for forests, a lot of the, the, the stuff will be at the land processes DAC at the EROS data center of the U.S. Geological Survey in Sioux Falls, uh, South Dakota. Um, but uh, so the data are, are spread around um, in different places where usually there's knowledgeable scientists to help uh, curate the data. So this idea of, of we acquire the data, we share the data, we distribute the data, we help people work with it is an important part. Um, data shared are much more valuable than data that um, are, are, are not. So what are we seeing? Uh, what are we learning? So I'll just give a few examples. I mentioned uh, the SMAP satellite for doing soil moisture. So uh, we launched that a um, year and a half ago. And very quickly, uh, we were able to demonstrate that we were measuring th soil moisture. Um, areas that, that are, 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 are moist show up as moist. Areas that are dry show up as dry. Areas that, that, that get rain. Um, get moisture areas after that they start to dry off so uh, we're really just starting to work with the, the data set um, right now it, it doesn't work so well of soil moisture in heavily forested regions um, but in areas of uh, 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 limited vegetation especially crop areas it it's, seems to be working quite well um, we try to piece things together so you can have the global water cycle. Um, this is precipitation data that comes from our global precipitation measurement mission. Um, it's a partnership with Japan. Uh, and uh, what we actually try to do to get global three hourly data is combine data with passive uh, sensors on a variety of research and operational satellites from uh, 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 partners and to get to um, th this three hourly data because we know that some things in the earth you can look at once or twice a day and feel pretty confident that it's not going to change very much. But precipitation, you know, changes a lot over the course of the day. And with the GPM satellite with Japan, they, they had a, a dual frequency radar on there. So we were also getting information about snow, which we didn't from its predecessor satellite, the TRIM, the Tropical Rainfall Measurement Mission, um, <coughs> launched in 97 for a three-year miss mission. and. Uh, came down in um, 2014, so we got, I guess, about 17 years um, uh, um, out, out of that. So, And uh, GPM's in a higher inclination orbit, so we're getting information at higher latitudes as well. And we also launched, um, about a year and a half ago, um, or I guess two years ago, the Orbiting Carbon Observatory to measure carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And uh, one can look at, at uh, spatial variations, seasonal variations, and um, uh, now beginning to look at it over a period of time. Uh, carbon dioxide is the primary uh, greenhouse gas that's contributing to planetary warming. Um, and one can look at the, the changes that are taking place in that over a, a period of time. And uh, I'm not going to go through all of this, but this is an, an idea that you know we're looking at pieces of the water cycle, we're looking at pieces of the carbon cycle. And, and a lot of the Earth system science that we try to do is to piece those together into integrated stories. Um, we, we can look at, at, in some cases, at uh, water that's stored underground through the GRACE satellites. Those are two satellites in partnership with, with Germany, and they actually measure subtle variations over space and time in the uh, uh, gravitation. Uh, and the only thing that really changes gravitation with time is, is relates to the changes in the mass of the Earth below. And the only real thing that changes the mass of the Earth below is changes in water storage or changes in ice. So uh, GRACE was launched in 2002. Um, and uh, 
over more than a decade, one has been able to look and see over periods of times areas where the, the mass has changed, has uh, increased because of additional water, areas where it's decreased because of loss of stored water uh, or changes in, in ice mass. So you especially you see the red colors where you've lost ice mass, um, like the ice sheets in Greenland and, and West Antarctica, or where you've lost stored water um, uh, underground uh, aquifers, and some areas where you've gained moisture, um, areas that have had heavy precipitation, and you can actually compare that to precipitation and stream flow, and it all checks out. And one can use Landsat data. This is work that's done at the University of Maryland, looking at um, uh, areas of tree cover and, and forest loss and gain, and look at areas where you've got forests, and where over that about 15-year period, you've seen forest cover increasing, where you've seen forest cover decreasing, and where you see forest cover having both increased and decreased, depending on where you look at the time o over that. So um, you know, one of the, the lessons when you look at the Earth and look at changes, um, you tend not to see a lot of spatially uniform or sort of temporally monotonic signals. Uh, the Earth plays you know, plays tricks on us, so to speak, and the Earth is a complicated place. So it's really important to have that global view and that continuous view, because if you only look at some places or you only look at some times, you could actually end up with a an incorrect conclusion um, uh, because of that variability. Uh, one can look at, at uh, where far, say, in the U.S. have changed, and this represents 25 years of, um, uh, of Landsat data, and um, so that over a period of time, you can um, see where the, um, uh, the you can see the, the time going, and the, the yellow will represent areas where you have um, disturbance. And if I let this play long enough, it'll um, zero in on certain areas and show uh, the nature of disturbance um, where you've had changes in forest cover, which could relate to um, uh, clearing. It could relate to in insect infestation. Uh, this one that would show for where a hurricane hit the coast, one where a tornado went through. So the point is that there's a lot of things that can influence uh, forest cover, but we have the ability to look in unprecedented detail, and while this is the U.S., there's similar kinds of things that um, one, one can do. But in the interest of time, I'm not going to run through um, uh, all of this. This is, uh, I think it's going to an area in West Virginia where you've got mountaintop mining, so there's a lot of clearing that's been done. Um, and then there's some detailed scientific studies that people do with a variety of data, especially to try to look at a sense of, of, of greenness. Is the earth getting greener? Is the earth getting browner? Um, and, uh, or, or, or maybe both, depending on where you look, which is typically what happens. And then they try to figure out why, so we're not just characterizing, but we're understanding. And, you know, sort of the, the mental model is we characterize, we understand, and then ultimately we'd like to be able to predict. So this is vegetation greenness uh, trends in Canada and US, and you can see reference to the work that was done, Jeff Masix at the Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. Uh, and uh, they, they looked over a period of um, close to 20 years at the vegetation index and see um, a lot of areas of green, uh, some areas of brown. Um, and uh, again, this idea that you really got to look at the whole picture, because otherwise, if you pick one spot, you may not get a consistent answer. And then there's some other work that's been done more globally. Um, I think uh, Ranko Minani at the uh, Boston University in the US used um, uh, uh, sort of multi-spectral data, especially from MODIS um, uh, instruments that we fly and the predecessor AVHRR instruments. Um, and uh, they're looking at CO CO2 fertilization, um, explain some of it. Um, but it's a complicated picture in some areas. You're changing the land cover so there's less uh, or more stuff to grow. Um, so, but it's hard, hard enough to understand, but the fact that we have data helps us. Um, so I wanted to say a little bit about fires because fires are a major thing that can influence forests and, and uh, you can begin to think of forests. Are, fires are also interesting because we sometimes talk about forcings and feedbacks and a, a fire, depending on your perspective, can be a forcing because it'll change the forest, it'll put stuff into the atmosphere, but it can be a feedback too because if the uh, hydrologic regime of the earth changes, um, things may be more prone to fire, the fires will burn, and uh, you can get cycles from that. So um, especially with the MODIS um, instrument, um, 
in instruments that fly, we have the ability to look at different parts of the globe. And what you'll see here is superimposed on the um, uh, the, the uh, vegetation index will be the red squares where the fires are. And depending on where you look at, at the, the points that you can see um, where the forests are, and especially when you start looking at places like um, Africa, um, Latin, uh, South America, or parts of Southeast Asia, um, the, the ability to really characterize in a quantitative way where fires are, um, and then begin to think about what that means for the forest, what that means for um, all the other parts of the Earth system. That's something that we've really never had before. Um, but to have that consistent and, and uh, quantitative data is important. Um, so then one can then look at the um, uh, burned area, and this shows some work that, again, using the, the uh, MODIS instruments, and it's over 15 years, and you can see the areas that have been burned, the sort of the, the, the hotter colors, the uh, yellow, orange, rather, areas that have more burning, and then the uh, other areas are, are not. So again, we're getting at a quantitative way, and, and from the Earth System of Science viewpoint, it's not just what is you know, what is the area burning, but what, is, what happens to the areas that burn? What does it mean for precipitation, infiltration, and runoff? What does it mean for uh, partitioning of uh, latent heat? What does it mean for um, the, the trace gases and particulates that get put into the atmosphere? Um, and that's a particularly important thing. Again, using MODIS data, one can look over a period of time at the um, uh, global aerosol distribution in terms of aerosol optical depth, and if you look uh, at over the oceans, especially like in the, in the uh, tropical Atlantic, one of the largest sources of aerosol distributions over the, uh, the uh, oceans will be um, uh, the, the uh, particulates from biomass burning, um, especially in Africa and South America. You'll see other sources, especially mineral desert dust that bl that's lofted off the continent, blown out over the oceans, or you can have particles from um, incomplete um, combustion that will uh, in, in large metropolitan areas and uh, they, they uh, go off as well. So this is, you begin to connect the dots this way because we can look at, you know, where are the forests, where is the burning taking place, what does that do for the atmosphere? You see it in particulates. Uh, you can see it in carbon monoxide. Um, the AIRS instrument that flies aboard our aqua satellite, this is mid-tropospheric uh, carbon monoxide and the areas that produce the greatest mid-tropospheric carbon dioxide tend to be the areas of the of, of greatest pollution. This is a uh, greatest burning. This is over a several month period in 2005. And you can actually see the plumes moving. So the, this is a, a case of showing how the burning of forests introduce pollution into the, the middle of the troposphere where it can get blown across oceans and then become part of the sort of background concentrations in, in other areas. And one can actually look at some things in um, carbon dioxide as well uh, from the orbiting carbon observatory satellite that I showed. One, one can see enhancements in the CO2 that the OCO2 satellite sees um, in regions where you've had fire emissions. And one also sees the uh, carbon monoxide from the MOPIT instrument that flies aboard our Terra satellite. MOPIT was provided by um, Canada. And uh, again, the, the, sort of the international nature of what we do is so important. You know, we collab provide, partners provide instruments, we work together. Um, we fly together and we learn things about the whole globe and we share information. Uh, so that's just some examples relative to fires. For the global carbon cycle, because um, the carbon cycle is uh, so uh, critical in terms of um, the, the anthropogenic forcing of uh, uh, climate change, that's what the nations of the world got together in Paris last year at the UN um, uh, Climate Convention to uh, agree to have voluntary limits. So what we're trying to do is to determine information about quantitative aspects, we have something that we call a carbon monitoring system program. Now, we're not really going to do a whole carbon monitoring system, but it's designed to, to sort of help demonstrate some things. So we're trying to get information about biomass, especially above ground biomass and on land, uh, fluxes, uh, how is carbon exchanged between the surface um, a biosphere, land and ocean with the atmosphere, and some scoping and then used user engagement efforts. So, um, so we've had a flux pilot that we really tried to look at using observationally constrained models because if we can begin to understand where the vegetation is, what the vegetation does, what drives the vegetation, um, and now begin to look at the CO2 in, in the atmosphere, and we can do ocean biology as well using uh, MODIS instruments, um, we can back out what the uh, infer 
where carbon is going, so the net flow from land to atmosphere, where it's atmosphere to land, and try to understand how that changes with time and will change with the future. Biomass um, pilot, we try to use um, uh, sort of a combination of uh, satellite data, but also um, local airborne uh, LIDAR data to try to get information um, about vegetation canopy. But the, the idea for us at NASA especially is to work towards scaling things up. So we've had some significant um, LIDAR studies that have been done in, in Maryland, especially Western Maryland. We had some work in Sonoma County, California. Um, and we've also had some work that's been done in um, uh, Indonesia um, that, that uh, some people have done there in, in terms of trying to get data so that we could get some information to look at um, uh, biomass there. So we uh, last year solicited um, some more for our carbon monitoring system and have another solicitation that we hope to be putting out before too long. So what about the future? Um, I showed a, um, a busy and complicated chart before about what we've got now. And the one that we're going to do in the future is just about as busy and complicated. And there's some things that don't even show up on this one, like some CubeSats that we're going to be launching largely for technology. You can see who our partners are on, on, on this, um, because there's, again, about half of these things that we do um, with, uh, with others, and maybe half or maybe less than that that we're doing ourselves. Um, and in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, I should say the, ne the next ones, um, one of the next ones up, um, th th it's a constellation of eight satellites. It's um, called Cygnus um, to study winds associated with tropical cyclones, and that's due to launch, I think, at this point, early December. Um, it was going to be November, but you know, launches, as you say, only move to the right. Um, so early December. And then the other thing that we're doing a lot of now is using the International Space Station as a, um, a, as a platform for Earth observation. Um, there's a number of things that, that, a few that have been there and a number that are going there more, um, and uh, two that are due to uh, launch in the next couple of months, a lightning sensor and an ozone uh, aerosol profiler. Um, but one of the ones that I would like to talk about is one that's a, a LIDAR for vegetation um, that's called JEDI, did launch in 2019 or so, and it'll go, it's another example of international things, it'll go on, on the uh, Japanese um, a, a, a exposed facility that's on the ISS. So JEDI will be a, a, a LIDAR. Um, international Space Station isn't in, doesn't go pole to pole. It's a 51 degree orbit, so it'll give us 51 north to 51 south, but that's certainly great for tropical forests. It w obviously won't do all the boreal forests. Um, so we'll get information about the ecosystem structure. Um, it'll have multiple lasers and uh, have small footprints uh, closely spaced to really help us get information about that. And the idea is that it, it's a LIDAR waveform. Um, I'm sure a lot of you can understand that stuff way better than, than I do. But the point is that you can get uh, vertical information, that vertical information, um, about canopy height, canopy cover, um, some sense of the nature of the profile, and turn that into information about above ground biomass. And there will be a variety of products um, associated various at, at different levels, uh, sort of ones that are just based on what the satellite shows, but then when we work towards things that involve more models and get towards higher level data products that will come out further into the future because there's more science work that has to be done. Principal investigator for that is somebody named Raf Dubaya at the University of Maryland. Um, and then we're working on a, a radar, NISAR, for the NASA ISRO, the Indian Space Research Organization, synthetic aperture radar, where um, they're providing an S-band radar, we'll provide the L-band, um, and uh, we, we, we combine on different things that'll launch in a couple of years, but that, that's something that should be really good, not just for forests, but it's also going to provide information about um, uh, land surface, uh, uh, the, the land surface itself, ice and hydrology, but it really critical for, for forests, and uh, the, the science is traceable back uh, to a, a variety of things based on the, the techniques that are going to be used, and um, you'll get a lot of information, and uh, uh, especially um, looking at different areas where the above ground biomass is, is, is less, more, um, but a variety of different regions that we'll be able to study. Um, so as one looks into the future, um, European Space Agency is going to launch the biomass satellite, um, P-band radar. We'll launch uh, with India, the NISAR with L-band, and, and S-band. We'll have the JEDI uh, LIDAR. We have ISAT too. I'll say a little bit about that LIDAR. So 
lots of opportunities to collaborate to understand, you know, how do we intercompare, how do we work calibration and validation. So we had a workshop in Washington um, a couple of months ago where people really got together and um, have been talking about uh, some of the things that we'll get to do. So it's a great example of the opportunity for calibration and validation because multiple providers, multiple partners, but especially when you start dealing with these land things, every place is different. And it's important that the calibration and validation that we do be appropriate to the unique geochemical or, or uh, you know, biogeochemical and geophysical environments. So that's something really then that all the nations of the world can participate in. Uh, I mentioned ISAT 2, 2018 or so. It's a LIDAR that's primarily for studying ice sheet thickness, but it's a LIDAR, so when it's over land, it should be able to get information about vegetation canopy or, or aerosols and clouds um, in areas where it, it, if the laser doesn't penetrate. Um, and that, again, this is multiple lasers, unlike the ISAT that we did um, uh, uh, previously, um, so um, there'll be a lot more information than we will have before, especially in, in sloped areas that we had trouble uh, trouble with before. So, um, so, so that's something else that we'll be doing. Uh, and then finally, I mentioned um, the Landsat series. Um, the Landsat 8 was launched, I think, in 2012. Um, we build them. The U.S. Geological Survey operates and, and um, uh, uh, distributes the data and maintains the data, but Landsat 9 will be looking at 2021, um, sort of a, is, as close to a rebuild as we can, but the up to upgraded thermal IR spectrometer. I think they just signed the, I, I read the press release, they just signed the contract yesterday for the um, spacecraft. Uh, we're trying to do some technology innovation, and then um, Landsat 10, um, the hope is that, um, that that'll be uh, further into the future, maybe in, involving some new technology they were developing, because uh, the, the administration's FY17 budget had something that, that we call sustainable land imaging. So uh, when you're doing forests, um, the Landsat is critical. It goes back, we just recently celebrated 40 uh, year anniversary for Landsat. And I think in much of the world, when you say remote sensing, they think Landsat or maybe Landsat and MODIS. So there's so much of what we do um, that, that uh, that's critical to Landsat 9 mission overview. Uh, so it's going to be a lot like um, Landsat 8, but especially the thermal IR sensor looking to um, um, to upgrade. So I'm not going to say much more about that. Um, I did want to just show uh, some things about what that technology is doing, uh, program is doing under the sustainable land imaging technology. So they're funding uh, some groups, mainly in industry, to develop some new techniques. And the top four will be sort of bigger efforts than the uh, the, the two at the bottom. So the hope is that by investing in technology development, especially for different kinds of sensors, um, at, you know, at the very detailed technical level, maybe by the time we get to um, uh, uh, land, thinking about Landsat 10, there'll be some new technology that will have uh, more capability or be able to be smaller. And especially if it's smaller, that means you can put on a smaller spacecraft. Um, so you can use a, a, a less big launch vehicle. Um, and, and that brings the cost down and maybe the quality will be up because especially one would like to try to do things in a way that you can get better uh, revisit. Um, and there's a lot of international coordination that gets done. Um, you know, the, the planet's way too big for any one of us to do it all. Um, so the only real hope that we have of being able to do everything that our respective communities need is to work together. So a number of areas, the, the global observations of forest cover, global observation of land dynamics, uh, program coordinates things, and under the um, Committee on Earth Observation Satellites, they have a number of virtual constellations, and they recently created a, a land surface imaging one. So, um, um, okay, we can't do everything with satellites, um, and uh, so I just wanted to give some examples of some local, I guess, forest-related work that's being done uh, from aircraft. Um, we have a, a small little fleet, not that little, of aircraft that we use, um, and. Uh, this shows some of the places that we've taken our airplanes, and if I updated it to 2016, you'd see um, uh, things in different areas, especially we just completed a mission off of the coast of Namibia in southern Africa to look at what happens when the um, particles from biomass burning get blown out over the uh, Atlantic Ocean and come in contact with a persistent uh, stratocumulus deck. Um, so uh, we go lots of places. We've got lots of planes, everything from um, you know, ER2 um, that flies at 70,000 feet um, to sort of uh, rented twin others that, that can fly at low altitudes. Um, so there's a variety of things that we've done. 
uh, we've been working closely with the European Space Agency and scientists in Europe to study some um, uh, work on fluorescence in, in advance of uh, ESA launching the, um, l looking at a, a flex satellite. Um, uh, and um, the, uh, so measuring um, solar induced fluorescence from aircraft um, is actually a, a European group brought their instrument over to the US, put it on one of our airplanes, and then in September of 2013, and then our, U our government shut down, so everybody had to, to go home for a while. Um, but they're working on doing another collaboration with um, different experiments going into different areas of uh, forest, tropical forest, mid-latitude uh, forest, um, uh, you know, really trying to get the synergy um, so that um, as uh, scientists look ahead towards having more fluorescence data, where fluorescence gives you a sense of where the photosynthesis is actually taking place. Um, we, we've uh, done a series of Cal uh, airborne flights in California using um, sort of a hyperspectral infrared, our AVRA sensor and MASTER, it's a multispectral infrared, looking at a variety of different uh, regimes doing it. It was, I think, three deployments over two years, but it turned into a third year, and then it turned into a fourth year, um, especially because you've got very tight um, ecological gradients, um, and you've had significant droughts, so sort of uh, really getting to see things, especially the highly vegetated areas, change a lot over a period of time. And uh, we've been able to look at forest mortality ov over periods of time, and uh, we're beginning to learn uh, at that. And then some of the scientists working with it, this is a group at Harvard University, um, uh, is actually looking at sort of some elements of uh, ecosystem productivity that, that they could look at. You know, they get the data, um, compare to some flux tower data to help calibrate their models, and then apply it and really begin to look over periods of time and spatial regions uh, how um, not just sort of what's there, but what's it doing? What does it mean for productivity um, in, in ways that one couldn't do? And then we've been working again closely with the European Space Agency uh, in anticipation of their biomass. They were doing some field work in Gabon, um, primarily working with uh, groups from France and Germany. And uh, what we were able to do was to tie into that and, and leverage a lot of the significant effort that, that, that they did in terms of making arrangements. Um, they were going to be flying airborne P-band radar. So this past year, we brought um, uh, Elvis, uh, land vegetation, ice, um, LIDAR, and we brought our L-band um, uh, radar. We call it UAV SAR. It actually flies on a business jet. Um, and we're able to get some complementary data with uh, what um, the uh, scientists, the, the uh, DLR folks that, that ESA brought there were to do and actually got a number of coordinated flights. So we had uh, aircraft and, and they had aircraft and people and you can see some of the um, uh, radar uh, data and uh, Elvis um, uh, satellite uh, instrument was getting information there. So so again, the, the, the point, importance of going to different places and collaborating and combining techniques. Um, so. Uh, then something else that we're doing now um, is uh, just started. There's a, a campaign for Northwest Canada and Alaska called Above, Arctic Boreal Vulnerability Experiment. Um, it's a major terrestrial ecology field campaign. We've done a number of these over um, recent decades. We did the large-scale biosphere in Amazonia, and if one went back beyond that, we've done the Boreas campaign in Canada and some other things, um, the ABLE campaigns in um, uh, South America. Um, so to really look at what's going on in, in these um, uh, you know, forested and permafrost regions um, that, that are among the areas that seem to be changing most rapidly. Uh, so last year we selected a bunch of people to do ground-based work and to get them out there. So they're out there now. Uh, and then soon, like maybe as early as this week, uh, we'll be selecting airborne um, people to work as part of an airborne effort. And I think the idea for the airborne campaign, we're going to bring um, uh, the, the L-band UAV SAR, the P-band MOS radar, we're going to bring the Elvis LIDAR and bring uh, Avarice Next Generation Hyperspectral um, uh, sensor. So that's a you know, bunch of platforms, maybe some others as well, um, you know, who will be going there and, and studying the forest and, and looking down on the same areas where we have people on the ground. Um, and a particular thing of above is um, fire disturbance working group um, because there's interest in fires, there's interest in permafrost, lots of things that they're going to look to do. But this is one of the biggest uh, efforts that we're doing. So um, 
conclusion, very briefly, um, I, I hope I've given the sense of the value that space-based observations have in being able to look at the whole Earth as an integrated system, demonstrating the connections between physics, chemistry, and biology. Um, the, um, that, that we're learning a lot, um, characterizing things, but building up that, that paradigm from a category, uh, really being looking to characterize, to understand, work towards predictive capability, and then to apply that knowledge. Um, we're seeing a lot of changes. Um, because we have that ability to look at the whole planet in a sustained way and pick up the spatial patterns and the temporal changes, as I said, which tend not to be uniform or monotonic. Um, this is important stuff that we're doing. Um, it's, uh, you know, for those of us who are in the business, I think it's just a, a great joy for us to do something that's great science, leverages the best of technology, uh, really finds a way to bring all the, all the, the people's nations of the world together um, addressing science that's important to us because this is a science that helps us all um, make better um, environmentally informed uh, d decisions for the future, which is so important to our collective future. As I said, we can't do it all um, uh, from, uh, uh, from satellites, so especially with the aircraft, by combining platforms, sensors, systems, and people, we bring the instruments and the people to the places that we really need to go to, to look at those parts of the, the Earth. So I'd like to just you know, stop by stepping back, um, working with the uh, domestic partners again. Um, 2015 launched the Discover satellite. Um, it, it's primarily a space weather mission, looking at the particles coming from the sun. Um, so if you consider the part that looks at the sun, the front of the satellite, on the back of the satellite, there's uh, two instruments that look at the Earth, one for studying the Earth's radiation budget and one which is, I think, a 12-color camera that gives you essentially the opportunity to do visible imagery. So in this case, you can actually see from some of the big Canadian wildfires this year, um, after you correct for things, you can see the smoke plume. This satellite's at the L1 Lagrange point, a million miles away or so, 1.5 million kilometers. So in this case, from that far away, one can see the impact of forest fires uh, on the Earth. Um, but it's also fun to think about some of the other things that you can see when you're that far away of the Earth. And one of it is when you're a million miles out, you can see the moon pass in front of you. Uh, of course, the moon's a quarter of a million miles out. Um, so that's, we, we might think of that as the back side of the moon, but when you're that far out, it's the front side of the moon. It's still the dark side of the moon. Uh, but it's an example of the power of remote sensing to let us look at the Earth in ways that we haven't been able to look at. You know, a lot of things we're familiar with, but that's an example. There's still new things, you know, new viewing techniques, new geometries, new ways of looking at the planet. And, you know, I think I look at some of the things that, that's coming along now, constellations of CubeSats. This, this just, you know, we're not done yet. So I think, you know, you know Forest and Photonics 2000, 26 or something like that. There's going to be a whole bunch of new stuff coming out that'll, um, that I think has the potential to revolutionize science and uh, really contribute to management. So I've probably run over my time and I better stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cain. I'll try this now. Is this one? No, okay. Just this one. This works. Okay, do you have any questions from the audience? Yeah, the question was, uh, how easy will it be, say, for companies to launch CubeSats and get information? Um, I'm not a satellite guy in the sense of, of that, so from an engineering point of view, how much will it cost, how hard will it be? I don't, uh, I don't know the details. I get the sense that it's not going to be that hard, but, you know, that's easy for me to say. Um, that, that, you know, companies are starting to, to do that. Um, we're starting to do that now as well. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of opportunities, you know, because, you know, especially if one of the things that people want is more frequent sampling. Um, so, and, and, you know, two ways to get more frequent sampling um, is either go further away from the Earth and stare, like the L1 Lagrange point or geostationary, or to launch more satellites. And um, that's one of the things that CubeSats really 
are um, uh, have the potential to be able to do. Um, there's always challenges, uh, but people seem to be making progress. Um, a couple of years ago, I think if you were to talk to a lot of our science community, they would be skeptical. They would have been skeptical. I said, how are they going to be able to get, um, especially the quantitative data with the focus on calibration and validation and, and traceability to standards from NIST or some other um, standard, you know, how will they be able to do that on a CubeSat? Um, well, people are making progress. Um, the other thing is people say, well, maybe I can see it for passive sensing. What about active remote sensing? You know, can somebody actually put a radar on a CubeSat? You know, radars are big, they're power hungry. They, um, um, uh, and our technology program approved a, um, uh, a, a test of a single band um, radar to go on the, on, on the CubeSat. So, you know, the technology is advancing. There was a, a um, study by the U.S. National Academy of Sciences um, that came out um, this year um, looking at, um, at that. Um, one of the things that we selected recently was called Tropics. It would be a constellation of uh, 12 CubeSats um, for studying um, atmospheric moisture and, and precipitation. And then there's private sector entities that are starting to get into the business as well. So, um, you know, I suspect when we'll see a lot of activity um, there, um, but there's always going to be issues of about, um, uh, you know, how do you intercompare data? Um, and uh, so, you know, as I said, you know, I'm not a satellite guy, in fact, as a scientist. Um, I'm a chemist by training, and then I worked as a modeler, so I'm somewhere between the theorist and the modeler. So anytime I say anything about hardware, one should be a little a, li a little um, uh, careful about that. But I, but I think you're going to see more of them, and the impact that they have is something that um, that we'll see. But a lot of interest, and uh, so it'll be it'll be fun fun to watch. Um, I'm I'm hopeful. Any other questions? May I may I ask one thing? Uh, is there any any uh, uh, thing that you would like to measure or, or uh, like to know, but there is no uh, sensor or uh, technology to get it right now? Or, or is, is the technology already advanced enough that you can measure anything you like? Yeah. Um, I mean, there's certainly some things that, that are hard for us. I mean, w w with the exception of um, uh, what I mentioned, the gray satellites for getting like uh, uh, stored water, it's very hard for us to do things under the surface. You know, we, we can do sea surface altimetry, which gives you a sense of integrated heat content of the ocean. Um, so, uh, it, you know, and there's some things that we're just unlikely to be able to do based on what, what I know. You know, if you really want to know the vertical temperature profile of the ocean, um, you, you probably have to actually put some things out in the ocean. Um, you know, we can do soil moisture for sort of root zone soil moisture. If you want soil moisture further down, um, that may be hard to do from satellites. But, you know, some things you also that you don't necessarily have to observe directly, you can try to infer from a bunch of observables. And you have a model or a data assimilation system. And you say, maybe we don't actually need to ob observe it. Um, but some people talk about um, stored carbon in soils. You know, that's something that I don't I think that that um, we have w we have a lot um, uh, going on. But you know, there's always it's always the challenge. Some things it's um, you know for ocean biology where um, uh, we, we've been doing things with MODIS, um, but especially in coastal regions, harmful algal blooms. Um, uh, there's, there's more that you can do, but there you really want a higher res a spatial resolution and you want higher temporal resolution. So we're working on a satellite called PACE to launch in 2022 or 2023 that from a low Earth orbit point of view should help. But that doesn't do the, the, the staring. Um, so some other, but you know, we don't have to do everything. Like from the point of view of studying ocean color, to get the temporal sampling, the first geostationary satellite that was done was done by the, uh, uh, Korea. Um, and uh, that's going fine, so they're talking about the second one. Now, for geostationary, um, you really want a ring of about five, um, because, you know, if we do one, it, we typically, um, in the U.S., that'll be over the Americas. Europe will tend to do things over, over Europe. They can work for Africa, um, uh, Japan, um, uh, 
China, Korea may do for East Asia, India for Central Asia, Russia for some parts of Europe and Asia. So by the time everybody does it, then you th then you've got some coverage, um, and uh, so you get the sampling, and you get. But temporal sampling is really one of the things that 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 that's a frontier, because um, so much of the stuff that we do low Earth orbit, um, you get once or twice a day, um, Polar Sun Sync, and if you work it out, especially um, you know typically now. Um, there's a twilight orbit, there's a mid-morning orbit, um, and there's an afternoon orbit. Um, and uh, you know that's more than any one of us can do. But that's there, even if you can see it day and night, that's six times a day. Um, and then for things like land imaging, Landsat's a 16-day repeat, but with two Landsat's, we've been getting to eight-day repeat. People would like more than that. So um, the temporal sampling um, there, you know, it's not necessarily something that we can't do now, but it's hard to do. So it's a variety of things. Okay, thank you. So there is still room for improvement and further development.